next slide just so I can see what it looks like. And the next one? Okay, I think you're gonna be okay. Go ahead back. I don't wanna I don't wanna shut the lights out because I might fall asleep. <laughs> All right, All right Michael, go ahead. The floor is yours. I just do what is practically the largest philosophical debate or ethical debate, which is utilitarianism versus the categorical imperative. Both of which are trying to ascertain the supreme principle of morality, which is the purpose of any moral philosophy whatsoever. So utilitarianism. Now Jeremy Bentham, he was, he, bo he was born in 1748 and he died in 1832. He was an avid social reformer and championed such policies as animal rights and the decriminalization of homosexuality. And bear in mind, this is the 18th century, so he had some very controversial viewpoints. But all his ideas about social reform stem from a moral system which he helped create and bring into uh, the form that is discussed now, which is utilitarianism. The condition of humanity is Nature has placed mankind under the governance of two sovereign masters, pain and pleasure. It is for them alone to point out what we ought to do, as well as to determine what we shall do. Now, Bentham thinks that because these are the two sovereign, ma sovereign masters of all of humanity, we don't have any choice but to abide by them and create our moral systems off of them. And this has its uh, roots in the Scottish Enlightenment, which had preceded Jeremy Bentham by a few decades, especially in the philosophy of David Hume. Now, David Hume's philosophy was empiricism, which means there is nothing beyond what we can uh, sense in the material world, and nothing else can exist. So because nothing else can exist, any moral theory must be based upon the material world, and this is inexorable and inescapable. So Michael, just a quick point, just to kind of, I, I need a little catch up myself. So the, the philosophy is, Bentham says, there's two things that sort of make us, you know, run society or form things, pain, pleasure. And therefore, as we systematically go through things, we, we look to either ease the pain or make the pleasure better, right? Yes, the greatest good for the greatest amount of people. The greatest good for the greatest amount of people. So tonight, all of you nice people, when I wanted to retaliate against all those who weren't here tonight, you did basically the greatest good for the greatest group of people. You were willing to sacrifice your own personal viewpoint to say, hey, leave them alone. We're all together in this thing. Michael, thank you for helping me on that. <clears throat> Well, the nature of pleasure and pain. Now, Bentham said that all pleasure and pain is the same. It's only the way in which it comes, and he has several ways of ascertaining uh, the measure of that pleasure and pain. Intensity, how intense it is, duration, how long does it last. Certainty, what is the probability that it will occur. Propinquity, how far off in the future is it. Uh, fecundity, will this pleasure or pain lead to other pleasures or pains. Purity, to what extent is it mixed with other sensations. And extent, how many other people are affected by that actions. So already you can see an almost mathematical look at morality. And this is very useful for governments or businesses because it allows them to enter it into the philosophic calculus in order to arrive at a conclusion rather neatly. And here's an example of animal rights. So one, pleasure equals virtue and pain equals evil. And moral persons are, are counted insofar as they can experience pleasure and pain. Animals can feel pleasure and pain, therefore animals are moral persons. Pain, being the only evil, should not be induced upon moral persons. Therefore, pain should not be induced upon animals. Michael, stay right there for a minute. That's why we don't have greyhound racing. Because people started to learn about the pain that was associated with these poor greyhounds who weren't money winners. They didn't win races. And when people learned the truth about the way these animals were being treated, they decided to, to ban greyhound racing. And by the way, it wasn't put into law by the legislature. The people of Massachusetts voted in an election one year, 70% to stop greyhound racing. Then the legislature decided to make a law. That's a great example, Michael. Thank you for that. I know. What's important to remember with Bentham is that he didn't care what you as an individual felt one way or another towards uh, people or animals. He created an objective way of looking at morality, so there is no need for uh, religion or any sentiment to be involved in it. He wanted to change on a societal scale, not a personal. Now, John Stuart Mill was a main proponent of utilitarianism. He was born in 1806 and died in 1873. He was a child prodigy who received a strict education from his father, which led to a mental breakdown in 1826. Now, he, the self-diagnosed cause of this mental breakdown was his overly analytic mindset. He thought that, he had no, that there was no room for emotion in the ideas such as utilitarianism, utilitarianism, which he championed. So he made his mission to humanize utilitarianism in whatever way he could. And he 
arrived at higher and lower pleasures. It is better to be a human being dissatisfied than a pig satisfied. Better to be Socrates dissatisfied than a fool satisfied. Now, though Bentham did uh, consider human, human beings and animals uh, to feel pain equally, Mill built upon this by saying that humanity has a higher capacity for pleasures or a capacity for experiencing different kinds of pleasures that only we can experience because of our capacity for reason. Um, say, works of art. An animal can't enjoy the works of Shakespeare, but because we have uh, highly advanced minds, minds that are more advanced than greyhounds, we can enjoy the works, of Shakespeare, uh, the works of Shakespeare and therefore consider them higher pleasures. Now, in this case, is all persons seek pleasure as part of human nature. All persons desire pleasure. Intellectual pleasures, pleasures are considered higher than all, all others. This is so because people actually desire it. If you ask somebody what's better, uh, Shakespeare or James Patterson, most likely you're going to hear that Shakespeare is the uh, more preferred and the highest pleasure. And that's as far as you really need to go because he just cares about what people think and, that, and because humans have a higher capacity for reason, that creates the reality and pleasure is defined in how much it is desired. Therefore, intellectual pleasures are higher because they are desired more than others. So what about, I'm gonna jump in just for a quick second. Anybody here ever wanna have a sale, a career in sales or marketing? Anyone thinking of it? In my career of sales and marketing, I sell pain rather than pleasure. I hate to admit that to you because it seems a little manipulative, but in anything I've ever done in marketing, I sell the pain because we will, as Michael is starting to show us, we will avoid pain at all costs. We'll seek pleasure. So, Ogita, here's how I could sell you pain to come back to college. Ogita, you happy with your job? No. You making the money you think you deserve? No. Guys making more money than you? Yes. Did you miss a promotion at work because they said you didn't have a master's degree? Yes. Well, guess what? I got an answer for you. Get the master's degree and all the stuff I just told you about that you've experienced, gone. Now, if you noticed, I didn't sell the pleasure. Well, Gita, would you like to come back to school and sit in a room with people and talk about philosophy? No, no, I know you'd like to, but, I, you know, I'm going to sell you the pain. I took a philosophy class nowhere near what this young man knows, because remember I told him no mass at the graduation party. But I learned one thing about that pain and pleasure. When I had to sell and market stuff, I always sold the pain first. I don't like to admit that because it seems like I'm a bad guy. All right, Michael, you make it. Michael, I like to butt in. These, kids, these students know that. So you haven't been spending enough time with me, but I do butt in. I apologize. All right. Well, here are some objections to utilitarianism. Now, John Locke, who was the father of libertarianism, stressed that utilitarianism treats human beings as objects, and that violates their individual rights, their individual liberty. So because you only desire what's uh, the greatest good for the greatest amount of people, you can override the rights of the minority in order to achieve that. Now this is completely unacceptable, and the one example that is most commonly used is if a terrorist is caught in a plot to detonate a bomb in a major city, utilitarianism grants the government the right to torture the terrorist to get information to stop his plan. Now Bentham and Mill would say, yes, you can use torture in order to save the lives of however many people that bomb would kill. But John Locke would say that, no, you can't violate that terrorist, that human being's individual rights. And that is paramount. That is, uh, dominates over everything that utilitarianism So Michael, I'm going to throw one at you because we saw it in the news. When we had terrorists with President George W. Bush, and by the way, I kind of supported it in the beginning, so it's my confession here, waterboarding, where I was suspected of being a terrorist and I'm not telling you anything, so you you put me through some torture where you actually almost drown me, and I'll say anything at any time to stop that. Now, under the rules of the Geneva Convention and decent, as Michael says, just decent treatment of human beings, we don't like torture. We believe torture is bad. And yet, during the after 9-11, we were so nervous about our safety. Remember the pain thing? We were willing to do anything we could to make sure we were safe. So what, now, we're not waterboarding anymore. President Obama stopped it. But that's a good example of, of what Michael just told us here. Okay, Michael, I'm sorry again, but... All right, well, uh, deontology. This is Immanuel Kant, and he proclaimed that any moral system must be based upon human dignity. And this is building off of what Locke said, uh, he, but he says that any action that can be considered moral must be done with respect towards human dignity. And because utilitarianism doesn't have any capacity for that, 
any action done with a utilitarian state of mind, though it may correlate with um, the ontology, it cannot be considered moral because it wasn't done to respect human dignity. Now, Bernard Williams claimed that any moral system was uh, incapable of helping us in any way because life was simply too messy. And his, and his uh, problem with utilitarianism is that it didn't differentiate between actually doing something and allowing something to happen. Is it worse if I kill somebody or allow somebody to be killed? Util utilitarianism can't make a difference. It can't account for motives because uh, the only consequence is a corpse. Now here's a real world example, the Ford Pinto. The Ford Pinto was released in 1971 and right off the bat there was a huge problem with it. The gas tank was in the back of the car and in rear end collisions, a bolt would puncture the gas tank and cause the car to explode. Now after all the people who had suffered because of the Ford Pinto went to court, the investigation found that Ford knew about the problem with the car. They knew the danger that um, it posed to lives, but they chose not to fix it. They ran a cost benefit analysis and found that it was more expensive to fix the car than it was to pay all the legal fees, all the court fees that would come afterwards. But this calculation required that a value be placed on human life. And the value that they arrived at was that one person equals $200,000, which is $1,188,567.84 when adjusted for inflation. Now, the final nail in the coffin of utilitarianism is that it puts a value on invaluable entities. How can you put a price on, how can you put a price on human life? How can you value pain and pleasure, experiences which are completely objective? And because it varies from individual to individual, it's impossible to build a solid foundation on it. So now we move to the categorical imperative. Well, Michael, I'm going to jump in quick. You did a great. That Pinto, that Pinto was a great example. I use that in my ethics class. Michael's telling us the truth. Ford Motor Company, in a room, knew that people would get injured and may die, but they made the decision that it would cost them less money to pay those people out of court to settle than to fix the car, right? And then he gave you this crazy thing, but believe me, it's true. Behind closed doors, businesses don't like to talk about it. They discuss, and government does, what a human life is worth over time. So when 9-11 happened, and we had to help the families out, the gentleman who was responsible for the government lives in, we used to live in Brockton, he grew up in my home city. I'm on Martha's Vineyard, we're there to have a good time with my family, but I see him at a breakfast place. I wait for him to go outdoors, I get up and leave my breakfast, I go outside and say, Hi, there's Mr. So-and-so, I, I like the work you've been doing on 9-11. Can I ask you a question? How did you arrive at what it cost, what the money of one human being was worth? And Michael, here's what he said to me the rest of you. Well, let's take a kid who was working up in the uh, restaurant at the top of the trade tower, the Twin Towers. He's 29 years old, let's say he was making uh, 20 grand a year, let's just say that. So I calculated that out. I said, well, wait a minute. Who's to say that kid was gonna be making that money for the rest of his life? Who's to say he wasn't going to college and become an accountant? So what he did, it was a very difficult job. He tried to calculate out the value of the human being that lost their life that day, and that's how families got compensated for the loss of a loved one. Now, you can argue, as Michael says, is that really moral? Is it ethical? I have a little bit of a problem with it because I'd like to believe in a place called hope that we can all be better than what we are today, but that's what they did. That's how they compensated the families in 9-11. Continue, sir, you're doing a marvelous job. I should write you my check tonight for this class. <laughs> uh, the categorical imperative. Emmanuel Kant was born in 1724 and died in 1804. And he was one of the most revolutionary philosophy philosophers in all of history with a plethora of figures which are uh, too numerous to learn. But his main, but the one who is the is the category of imperative. Now Kant's concept of freedom is that in a resting state, say an animal, isn't free because it is only governed by, law, by the laws of nature and by natural inclinations. Why isn't this considered freedom? It's because we did not choose, that, well the animal did not choose to uh, have those inclinations, it does not choose what it desires. We are also subject to these, subject to these, and we can also choose to live by them. But if we choose to live that way, you will not be free because we will not be acting out of freedom and therefore cannot be morally accountable. And also, if one were to base some morality off of the material, material world, it would only, only be based on your individual perception of the world, not on the world, not on the world objectively. So it's frankly impossible to build it on the grounds that Bentham and Mill tried to. 